Good evening. Uh, Phil has strict rules. Uh, meet the errant, ancient mariner. I sat down before a poetry reading uh, over on 15th Street at the Revival Bar uh, that summer. On the stool open between us at first glance out of the corner of my eye, he struck me as a classic tough-ass New Yorker chewing gum <laughs> that would gladly deck and knock your block off of the nearest wise guy punk who was just asking for it by running his yap barking up the wrong tree, or perhaps just a look in general in a dis uh, direction he didn't like. He looked like in a shrapnel impact mine getting written ready to go off. Now this guy was in shape to boot with dignified duds, dignified white hair, impeccably groomed mustache, smoothly nursing a drink with a folder in front of him. And I'm thinking, yeah, union boss, uh, Bob Godfella, teamster rep, showing after work. And I decided to like keep it straight. Well, the scene I'm planning in is in between the goddamn air conditioning unit blowing ice cubes down my neck. And I want to move over the bar stool open between us, so all the other spots are taken. So I decide to make move and keep my pie hole buttoned up as to why, even if he decides that I'm some friggin' fruit trying to make a move. Bartender goes, uh, I guess that uh, seat got to you too. A little cool down there, huh, boss? Which, adding a reaction, my man says, yeah, I was sitting there first when I came in, had to move over here. Chewing that gum, he snaps it, sizing me up with this beatific spark in his eye. I slug my beer down and head upstairs to the reading. And a few minutes later, the ancient mariner shows up, shrugging me in recognition of some sort of suggestion, maybe, that we were separated as brothers from another mother. And he says, thinking downstairs, the same thing about you before. You're a contractor or a hard ass or something or another. And we've been friends ever since. <laughs> Steam heat cool. Hottest day of the summer so far that year in mid-July on the Fricassee First Avenue, and I'm doing steady, sweaty schlep approaching the corner of 12th Street, and this 80-year-old guy appears in a heat wave like an oasis image in waves in a powder blue double-breasted suit jacket with box square cut shoulders like Cab Calloway used to sport. His cream dress shirt with ruffled buttons trimmed down a mile wide, grape tinted freshly off the rack, 40s held tie class, perfectly centered, gleaming diamond stick pin, tan trousers with crisp razor creases, heel toned spotless white butts, with pink soles topped off with an extra wide print vanilla fudge swirl fedora and harlequin blue sunglasses, <laughs> and not a drop, and I mean not a drop of sweat on <laughs> This is kind of a shot in the dark. Are there any big Mike fans in here? Yeah. yeah. Come back, big Mike. Where have you gone, big Mike? We've missed being yelled at by you. <laughs> we need to be yelled at by you. Please come back and bellow at us. Shake your fist in our faces. And if we don't like it, offer to kick our ass for us. Yeah. We certainly deserve it. We've been asking for it. Yeah, we had it coming. <laughs> Bring back that booming voice. Step up to the box in the front of the room, swing from the heels with your Louisville Slugger Bros 40 ounce baseball bat indignation, squaring one up. Just stand up there and reread the riot act of anything that pops into your head that's driving you crazy. Chances are it's driving us crazy. It's been too quiet. It's been too long since anybody around here had the guts to let fly without restraint or remorse your gift for volatile, exasperated rage. So come back, Big Mike. Smack us around like in the old days. Pin our ears back. Take us down a peg. Teaching us all a lesson we won't forget in a hurry. <laughs> the 18th Sunday of Ordinary Time. After going to St. Agnes for early morning mass that Sunday with Edna, we stopped at the IJ and I happened to run across one of my poems in the frozen food aisle. 
It was about 70 years old now, had on a pink uh, pinstripe shirt, button-down collar, it's gold wire rim glasses, sporting dignified again, full head of neatly cropped snow white hair, and when it spotted me, out of the blue, years later, exclaimed in pure wonderment as I crossed his path near the potato chips, he said, my God, are you still alive? <laughs> The nature of the observation was delivered in anything far from a congratulatory intonation or tone. I was stunned. I shrugged and merely went out to the car, put the groceries in the back seat, and told my mom I forgot something inside the store and be right back. Marched right back in the IGA, quickly scanning all the aisles for the son of a bitch. Stopped down the end of the succotash aisle, ran that poem down, he saw me coming, and he wasn't too happy about it. I confronted him, introduced myself, forced it to shake my hand, and asked just what in the hell was the meaning of that previous remark? At that point, it got real sheepish, with lowered eyes mumbling something about Lucky Ward, and hastily shoved off to the meat counter. And as he slept away, I couldn't resist, I yelled at him, Yeah, well, you were a lousy poem anyway. <laughs> This one's from my good friend Bernie. 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 1984 to 2017. The clock struck in Twitter time to post. POTUS adjusted his bathrobe and palmed his device, thinking as he snapped off the remote on the television, snarling, time to teach those idiots their lesson for today. Sleep eluded him most nights. All six telescreens, high-def, 48-inch, hyper, cipher-link realities, blared on 24-7. The leader had one in every room. All the staff had strict orders. These windows on his enemies were never to be turned off. Sometimes late at night, he walked the halls in the White House in the wee hours in that bathrobe he didn't have. Other times, he'd be seen screaming at the television. Even the gravity of his position was not lost on him, thinking, I have the codes. Is this what it's like to be God? Abruptly, his teenage son burst through the door, eluding the Secret Service detail, asking, Hey, Dad, i got a question for you. Um, actually, I was sent up here really quick, so, Phil, how are we doing on time? got seven minutes left. Seven minutes. Well, how are we going to burn that? This is a story. Uh, I, this is a story that I that I had read about about a uh, year ago, and it just struck me as there was something that had to be done with it. Even if you're not a baseball fan, uh, this guy's story, I think, is worth retelling. It's called the Hit Man. A Buick sedan crawled the Providence City Street. That April sky was baby blue, the air light and cool, perfect baseball weather. But the man hunched at the wheel was in a different lineup that day. His name was Murray Pro Lerner, six foot two out of Brookline, Massachusetts. He was primarily a middle infielder. Newspapers from Burlington, North Carolina, to Walla Walla, Washington, all told the same story in the box scores. This guy could hit. Pro signed with the Senators at 18 and was sent to rookie ball in Erie, PA. Didn't start out so good. 13 games, batted 167, ended up enlisted in the Marines for the next two years. When he mustered out in 57, Lerner was signed on with a tip from a scout from the Milwaukee Brewers. His contract sold to the Pittsburgh Pirates a few months later. But word was getting around. Pro could hit. Pirates kept him close, an eye on him, thinking if Mazeroski or Grove got hurt, the earnest, respectful, talented kid at that time might come in handy. That season, Murray hit 400 in the Nicaraguan Winter League in 1959 and 1960, but Pro was changing, growing up. He was cut from the squad for missing curfews, picked fights with the Cuban ball players, and even a few umpires. Now, the scouts still said that Pro could hit, but he was developing a reputation as a player who was self-destructive and seemed to sabotage his own success. But the talent was undeniable. Pittsburgh kept him around, but Maz never did get hurt. And after he won the 1960 World Series with that home run against the Yanks, that folk legend wasn't going anywhere. 
Pearl's path to the majors was blocked. And at 26, he was middle-aged in minor league years. He was released by the Pirates in 61 and ended up catching on with the Mackham Packers. All the ball players were either has-beens or never was and all on the way down. But Lerner had begun to play in another league, more lucrative and room for advancement. His stats started to pile up there, too. Armed robbery, carrying a concealed weapon. A new scouting report from the Brookline Irish Police pegged him as a cheap hood Jewish troublemaker. Still, he could hit. 308 for the Raleigh Cardinals in the Independent Semi-Pro League in 64. Teammates remarked he kept pretty much to himself preferring to spend hours alone and he'd disappear and then show up swatting a suspended rubber tire with a bat in the basement of the locker room. Still on occasion, he'd do stuff that nobody could explain, like the time he smuggled a homeless hobo onto the team bus with enough beer to last for 12 hours. Next stop was Tennessee, 357 for another ham and egg league, bouncing checks, stealing hotel TV's defense. But by now the scouts weren't watching him anymore, but the FBI was. You see, Lerner's new teammates were cheap hoods with names like Red Kelly and Billy A, and the games were getting more intense. He was known as considered armed and dangerous with a gun or a bat, and in 65 Pro graduated to the big leagues when a minor league monster named Rasmutton, who was suspected in turning informant, turned up in a snowbank with a 38 slug in the back of his head outside of Boston. After spending the evening at Lerner's apartment, the investigation was ongoing. Word had got around. He was suspended from baseball by American League President Joe Cronin. Soon after, Pro rang the bell of another mark and turned a swing at his head with his bat. The guy barely survived and spent most of his days in a wheelchair after that. This caught the attention of the patriotic crime family, the Boston Red Sox of the underworld. They put Pro in the lineup with all kinds of hits. The latest scouting reports, he had ice water in his veins and could hit anyone without remorse and he was put up against. In March 1970, the Providence jury convicted Murray Pro Lerner of first-degree murder. He was sent to Rhode Island Correctional Facility with an indeterminate sentence of 20 years to life. By all accounts, he was a model prisoner. Could swat in the joint, too, playing on the inmate baseball team. 1980, he came to the aid of a correction officer who was being strangled by a cord by another con. The action was noted. His murder conviction was overturned around Christmas in 88. When he was released, he was 53. Lerner and his wife headed west, ended up in Las Vegas. Pro had finally learned his lesson, doted on his son, coached him in baseball. Wife died of cancer in 56. He never remarried, got real quiet. Murray Pro Lerner died in 2013 at 77, and the word spread around the baseball world. And all his former teammates who had played with him, who had gone on to the bigs with names like Gene Michael, Ed Brickman, Rich Rollins, Don Clendenin, Tony Perez, Rusty Stobbs, Steve Blass, Rico Petroselli, Tommy Agee, Cesar Tovar, Roy White, and even Mel Stoudemire, all said pretty much the same thing. Pro could hit. <laughs> Minute and a half. Well, let's see if I can get it in. All right. This is uh, for my students who show up. This is called the best answer I ever got on a test. Now the question, I didn't ask this question, but this is the response that Kate gave me. He wrote down, I want to talk about is hell exothermic, gives off heat, or endothermic, absorbs heat. Now, to even start to understand this question, you have to be familiar with Boyle's Law and its application. Just for the record, Boyle's Law states that gas cools as it expands and heats when it's compressed. So this is what he wrote. Well, the first thing we have to know, the mass of hell is changing all the time. For example, how many souls are in hell at one time, and if anybody could get out of hell because it got too crowded and needed more fresh arrivals. But we all know once you go to hell, man, you're in there forever. So nobody's going anywhere. So the assumption is that hell's got to be getting bigger and bigger all the time. I mean, think about it. The religions in the world, especially, they all agree on one thing. If you don't believe they way, you're going to hell. Although the course of history to the present has been the case. Look, they all can't be right. Probably only one is right. So everybody else, you got it. There's a lot of folks going to hell. Probably the majority of the human beings that ever lived on Earth are stuck down there. Now consider this. The population explosion of the last couple hundred years in recent history, a lot more people on the planet and the ratio of births to deaths is hardly equal. People are being born at record mates. 
So the number of those being biting the dust is equal or lagging behind. More fresh arrivals, more sounds, souls bound for hell. Come to think of it, hell would have to be expanding at an exponential rate. You know, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on to accommodate the crash. So how in hell, if you forget the point, <laughs> is the volume, heat, and pressure in hell remaining the same in relation to all the souls being added all the time? Remember Boyle's Law. I mean, you would have to have some real impressive expansion going on. It goes like this. There are only two possibilities. If hell can't expand fast enough to fit the number of souls pouring in, then it's only a matter of time until the pressure and temperature gets out of control and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> or, or, or this is the other one. If hell is expanding at a lower rate than the souls entering it, well, the temperature would have to drop until hell freezes over. Okay, so what is it? Hell, I have no idea. But I will tell you this. I know this girl since freshman year. I always kind of had the hots for her. Tried to get into her sack a couple times, but she always assured me to forget about it, telling me, I'll sleep with you when hell freezes over. <laughs> this has been going on for years. Well, as fate would have it, Tanya, that girl, were at a big party for seniors last night, and everybody got friggin' blasted, including me. And guess what? Yep, she did me. So I guess all this really does pertain to your question, further stating the revelation, if she slept with me, which she did, then hell must be frozen over and not accepting any more souls, providing, uh, proving that hell is exothermic, and therefore now non-existence. So I guess that means there's only heaven, and the proof of the existence of a divine being, which explains why Tanya kept shouting over and over last night, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs>